Take your Bibles today, turn to the book of Daniel chapter 5. We're walking through the, uh, the book of Daniel, uh, doing a series called Challenging Times, Courageous Faith. Daniel chapter 5. <clears throat> so we're going to take this chapter today and we're going to just kind of walk through God's Word. My responsibility is to you is to preach God's Word to you. So we're going to kind of walk through the, the better portion of Daniel chapter 5 this morning and see what it has to say for us. But let me give you the 90 second, kind of bring you up, you know, the book of Daniel. So Daniel was a young man, 18 to 20 years old. He's living in Jerusalem. He's, a, he's part of the royal family. He's living in the palace. He's got his life. I mean, what a wonderful life he's got, you know, uh, uh, sketched out for him. Uh, he decides at a very early age that he wants to serve God. You know, some, some young people, they want to wait and they want to kind of veer, you know, and do some other things first. Daniel was like, no, I want to serve God from the very beginning. So Daniel and his friends, they're all serving God. One night... The Babylonians, they, they overtake, you know, overrun Jerusalem. They ransack the temple. They take Daniel and some of the, his young friends. They put them in shackles, put them on a caravan, take them 1,600 miles to Babylon. He goes from one of the most religious cities of Jerusalem to one of the most evil cities in Babylon. And there Daniel and his new friends start to, you know, start to live this life. Well, over the course of time, as Daniel has been there, Nebuchadnezzar, if you remember the story, he has two dreams, and each we, we talked about each one of those, and he can't find anybody to answer the dreams, what they mean, so he goes and gets Daniel. Daniel answers, has the, uh, the answer for both of those dreams, uh, and, and he gives him these promotions in the government because of, uh, because of these dreams. And then, you know, we saw the last week, Daniel is off on a trip, and we see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Okay, so that's the two-minute version of the book of Daniel, and there'll be a quiz at the very end. So keep, keep those uh, things in mind, all right? So let's go to chapter 5 because there's been a little change. Now, Nebuchadnezzar has passed away, all right, and his son is now the king. Now this is the first appearance. His son was named Belshazzar. And this is the first appearance of Belshazzar. So we're going to read uh, in Daniel chapter 5. We're going to read because Belshazzar, he throws this huge party, but he has an unexpected guest. So let's look at this. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet <clears throat> for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple. So that the king and his wife, his nobles, his wives, his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine... They praise the gods of gold, silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Okay, so Belshazzar is the new king. He gives a banquet for a thousand people, all the nobles, the wealthy people. It's a huge banquet, and man, the wine is flowing, okay? Can I just tell you something? Bad things happen when the wine is flowing, okay? Just keep that in mind. I was reading this week. <clears throat> it was a guy. He he went out one night. He got hammered. He got so drunk, and he he wakes up in bed the next morning. He realizes he's late for work, and he's looking for his phone. And he pulls the sheets back, and he finds a piece of toast. And he's like, "What? <laughs> what is toast doing in the bed?" So he he gets up, and he's going around the house trying to find his phone. He opens the microwave, and he finds his phone with melted cheese on top of it. All right, I want to tell you: the more the wine flows, bad things happen. Okay, so uh, and listen. You know, I don't come from that background, but some of you may know this. Sometimes when you start drinking, you know, the more you drink. Dumb ideas become more brilliant, okay? All right? And, and, and then you kind of come to your senses, and maybe some of you, you know this, you go, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? So we see this wine flowing, and it's this revelry that's happening. And Belshazzar, he makes two bad decisions in this moment. Number one, he used the gold and the silver 
stolen from the temple of Solomon, okay? Now, this just wasn't, you know, any kind of cups and saucers. These were emblems that were dedicated for God's glory. Remember when the Babylonians came and they, they captured Daniel, they went into the temple and they took the holy emblems and they brought them. And Nebuchadnezzar, at least he was wise enough to have them in storage. But, but Belshazzar brings them out and they're drinking. They're drinking in this party. They're drinking and using these holy, these holy emblems. It just wasn't stolen items. Now listen to me. What happened here it was blasphemous, okay? It's a, it's a religious offense to God because we don't think that blasphemy or anything that's profane happens today. We think that that's in a bygone era. But I, I just want you to know that, I mean, uh, uh, speaking profanely or acting irreverently about God or sacred things, God still watches out over that. It's still something that gets God's attention. So they're, they're using these idol, these items, you know, that were for God's glory, you know, and it, we, we don't have stuff like that. So when I go, things are blasphemous. It's hard to kind of to, to kind of feel, you know, figure out what that would be like. But it would be like, let me give you this example. Like if you took the Bible, okay, if you took the Bible and you inserted pornography in the, in the Bible, okay, and, and that kind of feeling that you got when I said that, that's just kind of when you mix this holy and, and unholy, that's what was happening that's what was happening in this moment. It was terrible. He cooked those sacred items, and they were just using them for this purpose. And then, you know, like, like uh, he's giving it to his wives and his, and his concubines. And you know what? If you're a young person and you don't know what a concubine is, ask your parents at lunch. It's a good kind of lunch discussion that they can, they can answer for you. So, so they, he pulled the, the dedicated items to, for God's glory and used him in this party. And the second thing, he praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, wood, and stone. Again, it's another religious offense against God. Because God, man, God had been merciful to Nebuchadnezzar. Remember the story? Twice God had warned him. And Nebuchadnezzar had made these slight turns toward God. And if you remember in the last story, you know, Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind. Man, he was roaming around in the wilderness. He was, I mean, he had lost everything, his kingdom. He lost his, his sanity, and God had restored that. And we talked about that, you know, a couple weeks ago. So here, man, this, this offense is, is occurring. You know, they're, they're giving praise uh, to, the, to the God of gold, silver, bronze, wood, and stone. All right, so that's the first part. Of, of the, the party. So let's look at verse 5. So they're doing, this is all happening in this, in this party. And here's the next part. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as he wrote it, and his face turned pale. I bet it did. I bet it did. He was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. Okay? Now, I just want to remind you of something I'm going to hit in a couple ways this morning. For Belshazzar, the time for remorse and repentant, repentance had passed. It was now time for judgment. Okay? So I'm going to just say, because I'm going to make a couple applications out of this. For a country and for a person. There's a time when God says, you've had enough time. Okay? You've had enough time. Now the time is over and you, and you stand before God. Okay? There's just, there's just been, God says it's just enough. Okay? And the finger begins to appear and it's writing something on the wall that they don't, that they don't really understand. And this, they have this physical reaction this kind of sick feeling. Hey, can I tell you something? You don't want that sick feeling. Those of you that have sat in this church forever watching online, opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, do you know what kind of sick feeling that's going to be? You know, when the Lord says, hey, it's over. You know, it's, it's time. I mean, he's, he, he's, his knees are knocking. He's, he's, he's scared. And I, I just want to, just make an application out of this just for a few moments, you know, this morning. I, I think 
in our country, we're starting to see this finger. I think in this country, we're starting to see, see God's warning hand toward us. Because I could ask you this question. How's your 2020 going? Is that working out good for you? Had fun so far? You know, quarantine, shelter at home, you know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just telling you. And I, I just want to be honest with you. I think I've seen more spiritual shifting happen in the last five months than I've seen in a long time. Okay? Now listen, listen. We, we, what we are facing is not a random series of events, but warnings from God. Okay? All this stuff that's happening, this isn't just random. Man, that's, that's unusual. Wow. We're going through a little season of bad luck. We started the year with impeachment. We've had coronavirus that has worked itself into a pandemic with over 110,000 that are dead, racial unrest, 25 million, depression era unemployment, and we're $24 trillion in debt. It's not a random series of events. And let me just say, if you think 2020 has been fun so far, Wait till the presidential election comes up in November. We got that fun waiting for us too. All right? You think it's been, been a joy, just, just, wait till, just wait till that happens. All right? But I want to tell you, we, we've always had unusual occurrences, unusual occurrences in, our, in our country. But I'm just telling you, this has a different feel to it. There are things that are shifting, permanently shifting in our nation, and you, you, have to, you have to watch some of these things with a spiritual ear and a spiritual eye. I want to tell you, I think for the first time in my life, I'm seeing Matthew, Matthew 24, 8, the birth pains that Jesus spoke about. I think we're seeing those occur. This is not a random series of, of unfortunate events. I think we are seeing God's hand ready to speak to this, ready to speak to this nation. Contractions in, 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 in Matthew, he uses the term birth pains. We know it as contractions. Contractions are the tightening and the loosening of the muscles in the uterus of the, the woman that prepare and they, they maneuver the child to be ready for, you know, to be ready for the birth. And I'm just telling you, we are seeing loosening and tightening. We are seeing, we are seeing shifting and we're not done with this yet, okay? We're, we're not done. Uh, we have seen injustice. We have seen riots. We have seen violence. We are starting to see political correctness that will come to the church world in an unprecedented way that will be here forced ideology. You cannot think certain things. You cannot believe certain ways. If you're going to have a job here or even on your, on your social media, we are in the cancel culture that if they find anything out of line that you've ever believed, thought, liked, shared on social media, man, you are done. And I want to tell you, we'll, we'll go back the other week because it's about to happen, and we saw it at the fiery furnace when Nebuchadnezzar told them, you know, this is how you will worship and this is what you will worship. That's very rapidly coming to the church. Very rapidly. I thought it was a far out. It's, it's, very, it's, it's very close. So I just want to just remind you that God is speaking to us. If you, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. This isn't just a, some bad luck that our country has run into. God is shaking and God is preparing. And these are birth pains, Matthew 24, birth pains that are occurring. Because I want to remind you again, judgments is, judgment is coming and Jesus is coming. All right? Now listen, listen. Our problem in our country, we got a spiritual problem. We got a spiritual problem in our life, and we're trying to find a political or social answer to a spiritual problem. We're gonna have more programs, we're gonna, we're gonna talk, we're gonna spend more money, we're gonna have more conversations so that we can have a better comprehension of our own evil. We don't even understand the Understand the problem, all right? We're trying to find a political or social answer to a spiritual problem. It's like giving cough syrup for a broken foot or a cast when you, when you have the flu. I want to I wanna tell you something. We're, we're not dealing with the, we're, we're, we're not dealing, we're just dealing with the symptoms. We're not dealing with the, the cause and the core. And there's no one on the political horizon that has the political courage to go, hey, we got a spiritual problem here. 
Come on, just more money, more programs. That's what we need. We've been doing that. That's what we've tried for 20 years. I'm going to tell you something. We got a spiritual, we got a spiritual problem. We, we need to turn to God. This is a warning. I'm just telling you. This, if I've ever felt anything in my heart, this is a warning from the Lord. This is not just a, a series of uh, you know, unfortunate events. We're seeing God shift and maneuver things in this world. He's trying to awaken some of you. Trying to awaken the church. Trying to get some of your attention that he's tapped on your shoulder for years and you've never really, you never really turned. This is a time for awakening. And I want to tell you something. We got much greater, much greater things to worry about in the world, whether there's college football. Okay? You realize as much as we love those things, they are very small with what is happening in our world, what is what, what is happening and what, what we're seeing. Okay? This is the time to turn. He started seeing that finger writing and he got this sick, he got this sick feeling in his in his stomach. I'm just telling you, God's trying to warn us. God, God's trying to say to the church, men, you better get ready. You, you better get yourself ready. You better, you better read. You better read. Let's keep going through this story. So the hand starts to write at this party. All right. Then the king, look what he does. He summoned the enchanters, the astrologers, the diviners. And he said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck. He will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came. And they could could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So he became even more terrified. And his face grew even more pale. Now one thing he does is he's trying to find out what is happening and still why is happening. Okay. He's not not really looking at the core here. But, you know, here's another thing. You know, look, look who he calls. He's got a problem. The king summoned the enchanters, the astrologers, and the diviners. Okay? Now, this is the third time, the third time in the book of Daniel that anytime there's a problem, they call, they call this group, you know, they call this group first. Listen, why, why do we repeat the same errors that got us in trouble the last time? I mean, why, why are we going back to this bunch, this gang? What have they offered before? They had no answers. They, they had no answers the last, you know, the last couple of times, you know. Uh, what, 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 do they, what are they going to bring to the table? I want to tell you something. Listen to me. We, we go through this cycle in our lives sometimes of sin and poor decisions, and then we have the consequences of our sin, which are bitter, then we forget about it, then we repeat it. Okay, we go through it again. We do sin. We make poor decisions. We have the bitter consequences. We forget and we repeat it. Hey, when are we going to break that cycle? You know, Belshazzar is doing the same. He's doing the same thing. He's calling back for the the people that got, got his father into this trouble before. Can I tell you? It's time for some of you to break the cycle. It's time for some of you to break it. All right? Here's what Proverbs says about a person who keeps the cycle. It says it's like the dog returning to its vomit. Okay? Any of you got a dog? You know what they do? I'm not going to show you a picture. It's gross. All right? That's why I don't have animals. <laughs> One of the reasons. All right? I mean, it's just, it's just recycling the same thing. And, and then it says it, a fool repeats the folly. It's just going over. You're going around in the same circle. So I, I say to you, why continue the cycle? When will you break the cycle? Why don't you give God a chance? Why don't, why don't you break the cycle instead of doing the predictable cycle? Why don't you turn to God and say, Lord, I've messed this up. I've messed this up enough. Let me, let me, give, a, let me give you a chance. And some people won't do that on their own they got to have their lives completely torn apart before the cycle ends. 
And it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be that way. Some are just going to wait until they hit rock bottom. They've made a mess of their life. They're, they're having a divorce. They've got addictions. They've got dead ends. They've got nowhere to go. And at that point, they go, wow, you know, let me try to break the cycle. You don't have to wait until your life is torn apart to break the cycle. You can turn to the Lord now. You can have a new start right now. Now, maybe, maybe... You know, maybe you're in the ditch somewhere. Sometimes the ditch is the best educator that there is, okay? I hate it. Hey, there's a lot of people here. Their story is, hey, God brought me out of the ditch, okay? I'm just telling you, you know, you don't have to go the way of the ditch if you don't want to. But, but sometimes when you're sitting there, you're evaluating your life going, wait, why am I here? You know, sometimes it's a great teacher, but I'm just telling you for some, it is time to break the cycle, it's time to start something new. It's time to give, really give God a chance in your life, okay? So uh, he calls all these people together. They don't have an answer. And then he finally calls Daniel, okay? Because isn't that how it is? We always turn to God as the last resort. You know, when we've tried everything else, you know, when I've gone through everything, I've exhausted everything, I've done everything, now I'm going to turn to God, which I'm just going, again, you don't have to wait. He's not the God of last resort. He'll give you a second chance. Reach out to him first. Reach out to him first. So he bring him before the king. The king tells him, you know, about this particular dream and all of that. And, uh, and, he, and he says, Daniel, do you have an answer for the words that were written on this wall? And here's, here's what Daniel said. Listen to this. But you, Belshazzar, in verse 22, but you, Belshazzar, his son, talking about Nebuchadnezzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all of this, okay? He knew all the stories of Nebuchadnezzar. He knew all the stories of the repentance, Nebuchadnezzar going crazy. You were aware of God's judgment. You were aware of God's mercy as well. You've not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You've had the goblets, look what he points out. You've had the goblets from the temple brought to you, and your nobles, your wives and your concubines drank from them. You praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood or stone. He calls out those two things, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds his life in your hand, and in all your ways. And therefore God has sent the hand that has written this inscription. And here is what this means. Three sentences. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and is given to the Medes and the Persians. Verse 30, okay? That very night, Belshazzar, the king of the Babylonians, was slain. Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62, okay? Now, let me just say, I wish that I had a really fun message for you today, like funny, you know, uplifting you know, uh, four points for success and happiness. I, I wish, I mean, I know you think every preacher, it's their job to keep us sad and, and depressed, okay? I wish I had that kind of message for you this morning. But I'm just telling you, that's not the hour in which we live. That's not the hour in which we live. Here, here's a man who had lived for a period of time and God said, okay, it's over. Okay, it's over. No appeal, no second chance. It's over. And I just want to say for every, every person here, that day's coming. That day's coming. Either we, if we're with the Lord, you know, through, the, through, through the, the rapture of the church, or if we go through the grave, there's a day that it's all, that it's all over. Belshazzar realized his days, was number, his days were numbered, and it was time to stand before God. And a worse realization to that is that he wasted his life in the opportunity that God had given him. He wasted his life in the opportunity that God had given him. Because this isn't a man who was raised without a knowledge of God's mercy and grace. You know? And I'll just say that to people in our church. Okay? 
you know, you, you have no excuse when you stand before God. You have no excuse. I didn't know. I didn't hear. You can't, you can't claim that. You can't claim that. The realization that he wasted his life and he wasted the opportunity that God had given him. I want to say, are you wasting your life just, you know, just, just going from unimportant thing to unimportant thing? You know, are you wasting the opportunity that God is giving you to, you know, to serve him? Because there is a day that it's over, okay? There's no second chance. There's no appeal. In our legal system, there's always an appeal. There's a day when you go, boy, if I just had, Lord, just give me one. No, no, you've had that. You've had that, that opportunity. You need to know that that day, you know, that day is coming. There's no second chance. There's no appeal. There's some finality to it, okay? He said it's, it's over, and for, to, for you, it's going to be over tonight. That's, that's what he told him. Now, listen. When when I was in I was in fifth grade, I had I made a bad bad grade on a test. Now that wasn't unusual. Let me just say there was no shock to my system, but I mean it was just it was a bad grade. It was a high F, which I tried to tell my parents. You know, it's a high F, as though there's some value to that, and we never got on the same page on the value of the high F. Okay, and now that I've had kids, I agree with my parents. On, on that, so I mean, it was it was bad. The teacher comes. The teacher comes one day, and she said, right, "I'm I'm going to do something different. I'm going to adjust your grades. Okay, I'm I'm going to grade this on the curve." I had never heard that term before. I didn't know what that meant. She said, "So if you made this, and she started going, you now will get this." She graded my high F turned into a low C. Okay, I'm not sure what miracle of the curve happened, but I praised God for it. Okay, because what happens when they grade on the curve is there's this standard of grading that's out there. Okay, and we all know it A, B, C, D. You know the numerical you know connections that go with that. When they grade on the curve, they they say they're extenuating circum some extenuating circumstances, and and we're going to shift the standard that you've always known. We're going to trade that. We're going to change that. Okay. Now I just want to remind you something. God doesn't grade on the curve. I wish he did. I wish he did. He doesn't look at all humanity and go, man, boy, I wish they'd have got it a little better. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slide the scale. I want to tell you something. The scale doesn't slide. The scale doesn't slide. I mean, there is, there is one way that you come to the Lord at judgment, and that is through the person of Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, if you want to live your life of sin, if you, you want to pursue that, you know, that's, that's your business. But there's no grading on the scale, you know, that, that, that you can live a life of evil, and all of a sudden God's going to be merciful to you. No, there's a day of judgment. And it can be a happy day for you. It can be a happy day. For you, when it's all done and you feel like, wow, I've, I've done good with the life that God's given me. And you hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter to the joy of the Lord. Judgment doesn't have to be bad. Judgment can be good. But there's some, there's some that you'll be like Belshazzar. you just be sick. you just be sick. Because you know you squandered the opportunity of God's mercy. Squandered the opportunity of God's grace. So I want to say to you. Now is the time. Turn. Don't take any chances. Somebody called me a couple weeks ago. Said, hey, I want to give my heart to the Lord. And I said, you know what? You need to. And he said, I'm watching the news. I'm watching the news. This, this, there's bad stuff out there. It's just reminding me, I need to get my heart right with God. And I said to him, you're a wise person. You're a really wise person to look around and go, hey, this thing, this thing is, is heading down the down the biblical course, okay? Worship team, you guys can, you guys can come. I read the story of, of Pierre Paul Thomas. Pierre Paul Thomas, he was born blind. <clears throat> so when, when a person is of age and they lose their sight, at least they had the mental image of colors and depth. You know, they would understand yellow and red. But when you're born blind, you have no concept of any kind of color, you know, any kind of 
depth, anything like that. He's born blind. He learned his whole life to, to walk with the cane and tap the, and tap the cane and learn to navigate his, his way through, the, you know, through the, the, the little stick there. He's coming down from his apartment. He's 66 years old. He's lived his entire life in blindness. He gets confused on the steps, and he tumbles down several flights of steps, and it was terrible because it crushed bones in his face. I mean, it was, it was bad, okay? Take him to the hospital. He has multiple reconstructive surgeries, you know, in his, in his face as they're trying to reshape and reform, you know, his face. He started having plastic surgery as they were shaping his nose. I mean, it was bad. And as they were doing plastic surgery, the doctor asked him, he said, Hey, when we do this to your nose, would you like us to fix your eyes? And he said, You can fix my eyes? And he said, Yeah, we've been able to do that for a long time. And he said, Sure. He opens up from the surgery, man, the first time in his life, he sees the vibrancy of colors. He sees depths. He sees flowers. He sees all that you and I kind of, you know, kind of enjoy. But I just want to tell you, he walked in darkness for a long time and he didn't need to. There was already an answer that was already there. There was an already an answer. And I want to just say to you this morning, I realize, you know, chapter 5 of of Daniel, it doesn't have the word joy in it and fun and laughter and all that, but but it's an it's an appropriate chapter for the season that we are living. Hey, I want to tell you something. God's shaking this nation. I've been I've been saying this the last couple of months. You can tune me out, tune me off, ignore you know the uh, what what's going on here. But I'm just telling you, God's trying to awaken us, not just as a church, but as as believers too. And are you? Are, are you like Belshazzar? You're wasting, you're just kind of, man, working this cycle over and over and over again. There's never any turn. There's never any change. I want to tell you, there's a change. That cycle can be broken. I promise you, that cycle can be broken. I want to pray over you this morning. And I, they're, they're going to put this simple prayer up on the screen. And if you're watching me live, you know, or online, or you're watching me live, there's a prayer that's going to go up here. And, man, when you say that prayer, man, the beginning of the, the end of that cycle can, can happen in your life. I want you to know the joy of the Lord. Listen, I'm not trying just to get you out of judgment. I want to get you into the joy of Jesus. I want you to, to know the fullness of God that he's got for us here on this earth. So... Let, let me pray over you, then they're going to come and lead us in this time of, time of worship. So, Lord, I pray for those this morning. God, I pray for those that have uh, struggled. They're, they're away. They're not where they should be. They're prodigals. Lord, there are people that continually live on the cycle. Lord, I pray that today's a day, through your grace and mercy, this cycle can be broken. And, Lord, I lead some of them with this prayer this morning that says, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and my life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Can we just praise him? Can we just praise him? Would you stand? Can we just praise Him? Thank you, Lord, that you warn. Thank you, Lord, that you prepared a way for us. Thank you, Lord, that you hear, that you care. We praise you, Lord, for your grace and mercy. We thank you, Lord, that your mercy is not just to get us out of judgment. Lord, there's a fullness of Jesus that comes through that. Lord, we praise you. Hi, my name is Brian and I'm the pastor at Generations Church. Thank you for watching our service. If you're a guest, please fill out the contact information at gctlh.org forward slash connect. Please know it's our desire to provide ministry to every age starting at GC Kids Junior, our nursery program, all the way through our senior adults that we call teenagers. We also have many ways that you can be involved at Generations Church, one of which is our small groups that we call connect groups, or you can find your place of ministry in one of our serve teams. 
Please know that we appreciate you watching and we hope to see you in one of our services very soon. If you have any questions about our church or want to respond in any way to the service, please feel free to message us at info at gctlh.org. God bless you and thank you for watching.